First, China provided rare earth elements very cheaply to everybody in the world by their cheap labor, lack of enforceable environmental regulation, and their appreciated currency. Essentially consolidate, control the rare earth market. And then they said, well, you know, now all of you are coming to our door to buy our rare earths. We don't want to sell the raw material anymore. Our manufacturers can buy it cheaper than your manufacturers. They imposed a huge export tax on rare earth elements, and so one had a choice to accept a huge tax and increase in the price of the product, or to relocate factory into mainland China and buy rare earth elements on a local market without tax. It's a strategy, it, it, and it's working pretty well. Manufacturers which use rare earth elements in their products located their manufacturing base inside China. The jobs in manufacturing transferred from United States States and Western Europe into Chinese mainland. They've moved all the way up the value chain and are actually able to leverage their position into capturing other countries' IP. If Toyota really wants to build a, a million battery packs, in the end, uh, if they don't find a solution to the heavy rare earth problem, they'll be building them inside China. We just created a $150 million bureaucracy to hand IP and technology and environmental science to the Chinese government. Older folks like me will recall a day when earphones didn't look like that. The whole trick has been the invention of a little magnet based on neodymium, neodymium iron boron magnets. Extremely powerful magnets and they use a rare earth mineral called neodymium. So naturally, global demand for neodymium has gone and because neodymium iron boron magnets are so powerful, one of the places they find application is in the generators that sit on top of windmills. Because if you're going to put a generator on a windmill on this really, really high stock, you want it to be as lightweight as possible. Currently, it's all being mined in China. Now, why am I talking about neodymium? Well, because thorium is always found with heavy rare earth elements. If you remember your periodic table, the lanthanides, that column above the actinides, those are all the rare earths. Thorium policy in all Western nations undermines a successful development of a domestic rare earth market. All of the rare earths that most Western mining companies are willing to process are what they call bastnocytes or carbonatites. They typically select these rare earths not because of the high ratios of rare earths, but simply the absence of thorium. So consequently, the only operating rare earth mine that just opened up this year produces essentially the, the lighter half of the lanthanide scale and in fact does have some monazites which are a thorium rare earth and rich mineralization which they dispose of. The most common form of heavies in terms of total aggregate would be monazite or phosphate types. So what happens all across America, Canada and South America, there are beautiful monazite deposits that have heavy rare earths that could be very commercial except for the thorium content. Mountain Pass was originally closed uh, according to CEO Mark Smith because of the EPA in the state of California and some thorium that came out of a ruptured tailings pipe. So the thorium represents this unknown, unlimited liability to to rare earth production and so it plays into the hands of China. Let me tell you how this stuff was discovered. There was a guy named Glenn Seaborg who worked at Berkeley Labs in California in 1942. Coming off discovering plutonium, he thought, I wonder if we could hit thorium with a neutron and turn it into something. Remember, fission had been discovered like three years earlier, so they were still in the very beginnings. So he got this grad student, you know, everybody who's been a grad student knows what it's like when a professor says, all right, I want you to go into the nuclear lab and turn on the neutron bombardment system and expose this sample of radioactive material and find out what happened. Yep, I've done it, sir. I have, I have made something new. Thorium did absorb the neutron. It became uranium-233. Poor little grad student. I want you to go back and now I want you to, uh, to hit it with a neutron and see if it will fission. Because I think it'll fission. I think it'll fission just like uranium-235. Figure out how many neutrons came off when it fissioned. Because if that number is below two, we really don't have a story here. If this number, you come back and it says it's like 1.5, then eh, interesting fact goes in the back of the book. But if that number is above two, then that is a big deal. Goes back, comes back. So the number is 2.5. Seaborg looks at his grad student, this is December 1942, and he said, you've just made a 50 quadrillion dollar discovery. Grad student's like, ah. <laughs> Seaborg was absolutely right. He knew how abundant thorium was in the crust of the earth, and he realized that through this process, if you had some uranium-233, you could catalyze the burning of thorium 
indefinitely. Why do we care? Well, here, oh darn, here's why we care. There we go. Because every kilogram of fissile material will produce as much energy as 13,000 barrels of oil. Nuclear fission is a million times more energy dense than a chemical reaction. Civilization has changed over advancements in technology a whole lot more modest than this. What we need to be able to do is let another entity take that thorium, develop uses and markets including energy. The Air Force said the Navy has built their nuclear submarines but the Air Force wants to build a nuclear powered bomber. Now Weinberg was a practical man and he said huh that the purpose was unattainable if not foolish was not so important. <laughs> a high temperature reactor could be useful for other purposes even if it never propelled an airplane. He knew that to make the nuclear airplane work, they couldn't use water-cooled reactors. They couldn't use high-pressure reactors. They couldn't use complicated solid fuel reactors. They had to have something that was so slick, that was so safe, that was so simple, that operated at low pressure, high temperatures, had all the features you wanted in it. They didn't even know what it was. If this program, this nuclear airplane program, had not been established, the molten salt reactor would have never been invented because it is simply too radical too different, too completely out of the ball field of everything else for it to be arrived at through an evolutionary development. It had to be forced into existence by requirements that were so difficult to achieve and the nuclear airplane was that. Here's this amazing work that was done you know before I was even born. This is laws of physics stuff. I didn't invent it. All I do is promote it. Maybe I'll never see it happen in my life but somebody will do it. China's doing lifter, even as we speak. I found that out a few months ago. Where are they getting the blueprints? Are they developing enough? Well, I mean, they've they probably got a whole bunch of stuff on the PDF from my website. <laughs> it's been in the public domain for an awful long time. I just made it a little easier to get, you know. Uh, this is about 10 years ago. I got in the car. I live in Alabama and I was able to go up to Oak Ridge and then talk to some of the people there. And I said, hey, I've heard that you guys a long time ago did this really, really cool thing. Uh, what's going on? And they're like, yeah, long time ago we did a really, really cool thing. And everybody who did it's retired or dead now. I'm like, oh, well, that's not good. What can we do? And they said, well, they wrote a lot of papers and they wrote a lot of reports. I said, oh, okay, can I get them? Oh, yeah, they took me to this file cabinet. It was like full of stuff. Talked to some of my friends and told them, hey, this would be great for a space reactor. We ought to throw some money at these guys and get all this stuff uh, documented. And they said, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. So we got a little bit of money up to Oak Ridge, about $10,000, and they went and PDF'd. Not everything, but most of it, about two-thirds of it. So I had this stack of CDs, and I thought, oh, sent a copy to the Secretary of Energy, sent a copy to the Director of National Labs, sent it all out to these different places, just sure that, you know, they were going to get CDs from a random person and put them in their computer and study them extensively, all five gigabytes of them, and come to the same conclusion I had and change national policy. I mean, of course, right? If we do not get this message out to everyone, then nothing's going to change. Early 2010, EFT bloggers noticed that all these guys from China signing up from Shanghai, Beijing, and they started asking questions about this and that. They went to Oak Ridge. They took them around the lab and showed them everything. And it's funny going to Oak Ridge because they're all about the info and the nano and the bio. And you want to go, what about the nuclear? They never talk about that part, you know. Well, they get to the end of the, the trip and the Chinese official, his name was Dr. Zhang Ming Hen. Interesting about Dr. Zhang Ming Hen, his father was Zhang Zemin, who used to be the premier of China. So this is not a poorly placed guy in Chinese society. Trained in the United States, in Pennsylvania. PhD in electrical engineer from Drexel University. Very, very bright guy. They were under a non-disclosure agreement between RDOE and Chinese government. They weren't at liberty to say to the rest of the thorium community in the U.S. and Canada that they were visited by a top Chinese delegation. So they get to the end of the meeting and I'm told, Oak Ridge people said, well, you know, we had this great trip. Have you learned what you wanted to learn? And they go, we're actually here to learn about the molten salt reactor. See, we're going to build one. We've already got a site picked out and we're going to have it built by 2020. And we're here to learn everything we can about it. <laughs> <laughs> and the Oak Ridge people were like, 
Ah. The Chinese, who apparently have had a more far-sighted approach to thorium for quite some time than we have, have been stockpiling it for years as they mine for rare since 99% of the rare earths that we use, including those, those, those magnets. Well, when those got mined, there was probably some thorium that came up with it that's probably sitting in some barrels over in China right now, waiting for Dr. Zhang to finish his experiments with thorium molten salt reactors and to start putting it to use. China has committed uh, the equivalent of a, a billion dollars U.S., which, by the way, is roughly the calculations that John and I and others have come up with for the cost of actually developing your first units. So going all the way through IP to fully constructed operational units. This is the most important thing that's going to happen in the next 24 months, and whoever gets that is essentially going to control the destiny and the rollout of energy for the foreseeable future. We believe that the United States should be leading that. I can assure you the plan includes every single partner that we can bring into this worldwide, our friends in Canada, our friends in Brazil, our friends in Europe. If developed outside the United States, the NRC is facing absolutely very real problems in terms of credibility. You can't have the world move on without you with what, for all practical and measurable purposes, is a safer form of energy. Why are we sustaining an energy system that was the byproduct of the Cold War? I think if we could all just kind of go back in time, I'll bet you that, that all of Europe felt like America was today's China. What we did to the Europeans coming out of the First World War and the Second World War, buying up all the globe's resources, and becoming the industrial producer of everything felt very similar. But remember, we were about 130 million people back then. They're 1.3 billion. They need it. They need the power. Uh, they, they, need to, uh, they need to be able to uh, realize the promise of Thorium. But I'd also like to see us succeed, you know? I mean, we were working on this stuff a long time ago. We made great progress on it. We set it down in 1974 for kind of dumb reasons. And I think it's high time that we uh, we pick that thread back up again. We can be competitive with China on making patents on things that weren't thought of in the 50s and 60s. But if we wait, Americans, Canadians, Brazilians will be buying lifter and molten salt technology from China and paying them the royalties. We buy a lot of things from China already. You know, I mean, it's not as if we're not buying enough things from China. We are definitely keeping them busy. So let, you know, let's, let's go develop thorium. Almost every known way to extract rare earths from their mineral concentrates means that thorium just literally drops out like a rock and you have it. So while you're meeting the world's uh, rare earth demands, the thorium is free. So it's going to be the most valuable commodity in the world with almost no value. Enough people now, thanks to the internet, are learning about the potential of lifter and thorium and they're asking hard questions. Mr. President, you often say there is no silver bullet to our energy problems. Why is the federal government not accelerating research into fluid fueled molten salt reactors that run on thorium? Liquid fluoride thorium reactors. Uh, this is a kind of... You're already way above my pay grade, so... <laughs> I'll, I'll just ex I'll explain it to you because uh, this is the kind of idea Washington needs to know about. <laughs> And pretty soon, in 10 years, we're going to be buying these things from them if we don't start making them right now. The AEC report given to John F. Kennedy at his request in 1962 it addresses directly the fears that they had, and it specifically outlines what we should have done, and we have not done it. We can do the thorium breeder reactor, which Weinberg and the Ornell team worked on for 20 years and perfected and operated for four years in the 1960s. And that reactor is exactly what China now has a billion dollars to develop using our plans, all our research, everything that we did as, as an American research institution 49 years ago. Even if Washington does operate slowly, 49 years does sound to be a little excessive if we don't do it, it will still be happening. It will just be happening in a place like China rather than the United States. We will be seeing lifters built in the future, make no mistake. Let's say, for example, you had a single rare earth refinery creating about 20,000 tons of heavy rare earths a year. On current consumption, that's about 130% of domestic consumption for rare earths. It automatically undermines China's advantage. Now there's two places on the planet Earth where you have a guaranteed supply of heavy rare earths. What can your country leverage that into? This is the fulcrum you need to get back into the, the world economy as a manufacturer, value-added producer. On another note, 
you would produce enough thorium, which would historically have been dumped into tailings lakes, to provide power through the entire Western Hemisphere. And I've been told in every single presentation that's an understatement. If we can convince our government to step up to the responsibility of dealing with the rare earth issue, which means dealing with the thorium issue, put ourselves on the path for a new era in U.S. economic growth and a path towards total energy independence.